Really exciting to be able to uh, co-sponsor this evening in the upcoming lecture series. And it's even more exciting to see a full house with so many people that are helping shape Vancouver for the better, uh, people that are involved in nonprofit sector and in different agencies that are guiding transportation decisions in Vancouver. So thank you for coming out. I'd like you all to take a few minutes before we start and think about how you traveled around today. From the time you left your house to coming here tonight, did you walk, did you drive, did you cycle, did you roll, did you take transit? In all your movements that you made today, do you think that you achieved about 30 minutes of physical activity? I'd like you to mull over these questions and we'll come back to them in a few minutes. So as mentioned, BC Recreation and Parks Association is really pleased to be a partner for this series uh, with the UBC Active Transportation Lab and the city program. The theme for the series is transportation health in the built environment. And we feel that this, is, this topic is really timely because health, transportation, and the built environment are current issues that can be linked to climate change, population health, and even the economy. About a year ago, uh, BC Recreation and Parks launched the Built Environment and Active Transportation Initiative, um, which I coordinate. And we like to call it the BEAT for short because it's such a mouthful. But the BEAT is focused on um, looking at increasing physical activity opportunities by addressing community design, transportation planning, and policy. So it's quite exciting fusion of these different topics. The way our communities are designed dictates how we move around, whether it's from work to home to school to play. The term built environment is somewhat new to people and it really describes the physical characteristics of our surroundings. So whether that's our roadways, our parks, our schools, our sidewalks, pretty much all the environments that we navigate on a day-to-day -day basis. And our built environment really plays a role in either encouraging or discouraging the amount of physical activity that we get. Here in BC and across Canada, the health sector is really interested and understands that the built environment impacts um, our health and our activity. And evidence-based research has played a role in letting us know that chronic diseases such as diabetes, uh, high blood pressure, heart disease, and obesity are the direct result of physical inactivity. And it is our built environment that plays a role in this. People leave, lead busy lives and have less time. I think most of us can attest to that. We've designed our communities over a long period of time around the movement of cars, and therefore we've become largely car dependent. Earlier when I asked you, me, earlier when I asked you about your movements today, I wasn't really taking into account time spent at the gym or time spent at a yoga class, but I was really interested in you thinking about your mobility choices and your, and your transportation options. The reason being is that we have more limited opportunities uh, and limited choice in how we get around. Mark Fenton, an engineer and walking expert from the United States, offers this view on our society, that we have engineered activity out of our daily lives. The problem isn't simply getting people to exercise more, it is getting more routine activity in our day-to-day -day life. A week ago, I was at the Scotia Center, or the Scotia Theater on Burrard Street, which um, locals will be somewhat familiar with. And before I went up to go see a movie, I noticed this beautiful red stairwell sandwiched between two escalators, and nobody was using the stairwell going up or coming down. And it was at that point, it made, it made me realize that perhaps stairs are becoming an obsolete, lonely piece of infrastructure that we're not willing to use anymore because we have other ways of getting around. And in fact, you know, maybe we are too busy to walk or cycle. And according to Mark Fenton, maybe we have actually engineered activity out of our daily lives. 
Here in Vancouver, we're really lucky, uh, as Niels, I think, was able to explore uh, yesterday or the day before with some locals, that we have a lot of transportation options. We can take the bus, we can take the sky train, we can choose to cycle, we can choose to walk, we can choose to roll, and we're even really fortunate that we can take our bikes on the sky train and the buses, which is pretty great. But in other parts of the Lower Mainland, it's not such the case. If you think about Langley or White Rock, do they have the same opportunities? How about the rest of BC? What are the mobility or transportation choices for people in Quesnel or Campbell River or Vernon or Rosalind? A lot of what the BEAT initiative is focused on is happening outside of the Lower Mainland, but as well, as well here. And we're really looking at engaging community leaders and decision makers to help them understand that they need to make decisions in terms of policy and planning and design that will help people create more walkable, bikeable communities. And I feel quite excited because I really see in the work that I do that there's a convergence happening between different stakeholder groups who all have a mutual benefit in creating healthier communities. And we can see this uh, with health coming to the table, with environmental issues, with transportation and planning concerned with how people benefit from their built environment. And BC Recreation and Parks Association is taking a bit of a leadership role in the healthy built environment movement through our different programs and particularly through the BEAT initiative, which is a pretty unique approach to looking at land use and transportation planning with a focus on health and physical activity, which not, you know, those are the links that are slowly being made in our communities. Uh, next up, you'll hear from uh, Dr. Larry Frank. He's one of the leading researchers in North America on health and the built environment. And recently, um, Dr. Frank and his students completed a, a research report for BC Recreation and Parks Association titled Physical Activity and Transportation Benefits of Wa Walkable Approaches to Community Design in BC. And this research looked at how travel patterns impact physical activity, and it will play a really big role in supporting the work that we do in creating walkable communities that are sustainable and, and lasting. And more importantly, I'm really excited tonight, as are all of you, to hear about what active transportation plans and policies are happening on the ground in Copenhagen so that we can look for some solutions uh, for here in Vancouver as well as for other communities in BC. So thanks very much for coming out. I just want to take this moment to really thank Gordon and Frank Pacella, who really have worked really quite hard to pull together a wonderful, last year was a tremendous success and it was a real honor for me to be able to be part of it. And now, Kara, thank you so much for, for taking on the partnering, uh, which is necessary. We really need to grow uh, partnerships here in order to really accomplish the things we're trying to do. And TransLink as well uh, is engaged. So typically what happens is we may bring a speaker here, TransLink, you know, so Niels will talk tomorrow with TransLink, TransLink brings some speakers and we are all, I think, through this effort, learning from each other and really starting to build the coalition that's gonna be necessary. As you know, there is an enormous amount of momentum that goes uh, in another direction. Uh, and when we talk about how resources uh, really get spent, uh, you know, it's, it's very clear that we have a lot of work to do. We, we rest upon, I believe, the laurels of a lot of uh, tough decisions that people made over a series of decades in this region to make it known as one of the most livable regions in the world. Certainly was a magnet that drew me here from Atlanta. I think a lot of regions could have drawn me from, <laughs> from Atlanta. But uh, actually, if you've ever been, how many of you have been to Atlanta? I'm just curious. It's actually not that bad. <laughs> There's a lot of wonderful people there, too. Um, so I hope that's not an earthquake. <laughs> so one of the um, things I wanted to say was, uh, in addition to thanking uh, Bombardier, um, uh, I feel really honored uh, to be able uh, to to work in an environment like this where I think we can accomplish and we will accomplish so much. So um, I'm actually gonna, um, I, was, I was going to uh, mention a couple of things. This topic, uh, I'll just do a little bit of uh, quick history. 20 years ago, there were about three people that were studying the relationship between the built environment and travel, and particularly non-motorized transportation. That was a topic that very few people ever uh, uh, really studied. And about 10 years ago, 
uh, Robert Wood Johnson got interested, and, and Niels and uh, Gordon were just in, at the conference in San Diego. It's funded by private uh, uh, foundation money, public health money, Johnson and Johnson. And what, what um, uh, Jim Salas, who's the head of the program, said to me, because he and I are very close colleagues, we work together on a number of grants, and he said, he goes, you know, I have this new research program, and I'm wondering if any urban planners will apply for the funding. And I, <laughs> and I was just t talking about this with Niels over at dinner, and it was like I said, I, I think they will. <laughs> So now, here we are 10 years later, and most urban planners that I know, the topic that they're really looking at and are very interested in is the relationship between the built environment and travel, and in particularly non-motorized transportation. Transportation. So researchers uh, are now interested in this topic. I don't think it's purely monetarily driven. I think we are all coming to the, a lot of people are coming to the conclusion that it's how we design our communities really does have a causal effect on our behavior and we're at the point where we're trying to prove some of these linkages. So I'm just going to mention a few things. First of all, um, I want to acknowledge my students. I'm really blessed with having amazing students at, at UBC. Um, I believe that uh, two of my PhD students are here tonight. Hugo LaChapelle. Is Hugo here? He's somewhere in here. There he is in the back. And, and Josh Van Loon, maybe close to Ugo, are both doing cutting edge research on this topic and they'll be presenting along the way. I think you'll hear from their research. And Andrew Devlin, who worked on this report and did a phenomenal job. Andrew couldn't be here tonight. And I'm just wondering how. Andrew's here? What? You're here. I thought you couldn't make. He's here. Okay, excellent. So he's here. Excellent. So he'll know if I say anything wrong. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> so I'm actually going to jump ahead. I actually want to uh, uh, do this very fast and, and, and leave more time for Niels. I actually intend to keep my remarks short. Um, but basically what we did was, and I'll just sum this up, it's too many words. We looked at the relationship between how communities are designed in the lower mainland and how you travel. That's what that says. Did I get it right? But we actually separated out adults and kids, and we used the TransLink's 1999 travel survey. It was a one-day travel survey, and it, we have quite a good-sized sample, and we found some amazing things. We're actually pretty excited. We looked only at the trips, for those of you who may have been in the survey, that you made from your home. So we didn't look at trips generated from other places, and we linked that with the design of the neighborhoods where you live. So I'm just gonna jump ahead. We looked at a number of factors. Uh, we looked at the density of your neighborhood, residential and commercial, the connectivity of the street network, and how mixed use the land uses are where you live, right around where you live within a kilometer of your house. Something like this. So you might have seen some of this. These are graphics from, uh, this is so if you live in a house in a neighborhood that looks like this, um, then you can't get to much near your house. Not too many other uses than residential, but if you live in a neighborhood that's more connected, the area you can get to, the squiggly line, we call a buffer, a network buffer. And this is where we measure the built environment within. So we actually got the parcel data, every single unit of ownership in the lower mainland, and we drew one kilometer network buffers around every single household. And we looked at how connected and all these different factors, and we correlated that with people's travel patterns. This is a blow up. This is from a previous study we did, but it shows the idea. In older neighborhoods, like many of the neighborhoods in Vancouver, you'll notice that the lots are narrow and deep. So that, um, and does anyone know why lots used to be narrow and deep? Who knows the answer to that question? Outhouse. Absolutely. So you could put the outhouse further away from the. No. <laughs> No, no, um, in fact, the reason is so that more people, because commercial, this is the commercial uses, we, we always walked. <laughs> so you want to be closer to where all the stuff was, the retail. So we, always, we know how to build walkable communities pretty well. There's no, there's no challenge to that. It's only been in the last 50 years that we got away from it. So this is an older neighborhood, but basically we've been measuring this across the lower mainland. And in this example, you can see the more walkable areas. So it basically gives you an idea. We've been measuring it, and it's a tool that we hope gets used by other researchers, and we're working with TransLink to do that. So basically, I'm just going to jump ahead and show a few of the findings on adults and then kids and then conclude. But basically, we see the built environment characteristics that explain walking in adults. And we see what's significant 
All these, for any walk trip density, mattered if they walked at all, for walking for utility, or walking for uh, leisure, non-work, and so the discretionary walking. And you can see higher connectivity. All these things were significant at the 99.9% .9 level. Of course they were. They all, they all matter. They're all statistically significant when controlling for other things. The takeaway is that we know, we know this intuitively, we've measured it more specifically, and from this study, we'll have more specific results and findings that allow us to develop some policy recommendations based on evidence so we can estimate how much more walking and how many more people will meet the physical activity requirements based on changes to communities. And you can actually translate that into dollars saved through reduction in chronic disease and other outcomes. And we shouldn't forget that there's a lot of direct correlations, as Andrew is going to do for his own original research, with greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution. So we can correlate that directly as well. So you can look at adult findings, and this is looking at the flip side, vehicle use. And you see some of the same relationships. And I guess I'll back up. And for, for, um, for Parks and Rec, you know, we, we, we saw this and we see, well, walking in terms of findings, in terms of that was transit use, Wait a minute, I must have jumped ahead one. Okay, walking it to jump. So you can see, well, it makes sense that people would walk in their neighborhood if they have more parks and open space. So we added, this is a variable that is not commonly found in this kind of research. So we're seeing statistically significant relationships very much in terms of walking for any trip and for non-work trips, of course, because we're talking about going to a park. So providing parks in people's neighborhoods and making it nearby within a kilometer is significantly related with how much physical activity people get not only at the park, but how they get and walk around their neighborhood to parks. So we see relationships with transit, and basically this study will be released more fully in the future, but I wanted to give you a glimpse, and I will jump ahead and just say that the relationships are here for vehicle. Most, most of these variables, all of them, were statistically significant in the expected direction. We would always think they were, but what surprised me was there was no other study yet done on this topic in this way in this region. Most regions of North America or in the United States have had studies like this done, so this was an important opportunity. And I think we're looking forward to replicating it similarly with a more recent survey that was done by the Gateway uh, Council. Um, we're just gonna have to go over there and get the data ourselves. I might do that after, after the talk tonight. I'll just break in and get it. Don't we house them? UBC houses them downtown. <laughs> So anyways, we also looked at youth, and this is interesting, and I guess just a little glimpse, and uh, basically, we, we find very different relationships between youth and adults in terms of travel. No significant relationships were found between measured neighborhood walkability and travel in the youth study, but basically, travel and youth may be more influenced by distance to school, and they are. We have separate studies that show this. So different factors affect how much kids walk. We'll get into that another time. It makes sense, there's constraints. I'll skip that and just say, um, residing in a neighborhood with high, what I just said, but basically we're starting to get an inkling in this region about what's going on, a little bit on walkability, but residing in a neighborhood that's more walkable, the degree to which you might change your behavior varies by cons other factors, demographics and so forth were all uh, looked at, but I think transit and, and neighborhood design are very synergistic, and I think what we have to do is, uh, in terms of a policy implication and maybe embedded in this, is, is really to try to leverage our transportation dollars in ways that motivate local governments and municipalities to pony up the land use uh, and really commit to it. We are in good shape in this central part of the region, but what's developing south of the Fraser River is critical. So in order for the investments to happen the way we see them unfolding, we're gonna have to really get behind how the money is being spent and leverage really, really good land use planning out of the investment. So I hope that you're all ready for that, and I know many of you are for that um, uh, uh, discussion. So actually, I want to, uh, um, this is more than I want to present right now, so I will just leave you with um, some recommendations. But um, basically, we need some models for local high density, you know, um, local models we have, but basically south of the Fraser, we need some good models there. I actually wish to, how do I escape out of the, how do I escape out of the, oh. Okay, so um, I, what I, yeah, I wanna do it now. <laughs> I wanna turn that up. Yeah, I just wonder, is there a button here that, thanks. Thank you. So, 
so basically, in, in conclusion, I'm really excited to hear Neil's talk. I've been to Copenhagen a number of times. Uh, I told him I would like to retire soon and go to Copenhagen and live there and just bike around. <laughs> but uh, it's such an exceptional city, and your contribution, we understand, has been incredible there. And we're so excited to have you here tonight. And thank you so much, and I look forward to your talk. Okay. First of all, thanks for inviting me. It's a really pleasure. It's a really pleasure to be here. I'm really a pleasure to see so many people here tonight. Really uh, looking forward to that, and I hope you will have something on your way back home for inspiration of Copenhagen. Um, I prepared a presentation for you. Uh, it will take about 30 minutes, 35 minutes, and I hope we will leave time for questions and answers. And also, I have a small surprise for you in the end. But that will keep a secret until then. If you're looking for a pattern or a sort of a red line in uh, what I'm going to tell you, I think uh, you could look for something like, well, others are landscape architect, we talked about townscaping. Maybe humanscaping could be a uh, concept that we could sort of explore together during the evening. I was thinking of humanizing the cities, that's actually a concept that's been used very much about how to get people into use our public space in a more active way. And maybe the way that we shape public space could be something called humanscaping in the future. A little bit of basic facts about Copenhagen, quite similar to Vancouver probably in, the, in the terms of numbers of inhabitants and also in the area, although we have no high rises in Copenhagen as you can see. Why is uh, transportation so interesting for, for me or for talking about active living? It's of course about our place of mobility. First and all, transportation is to provide mobility for the cities and the people living in the cities. But it's also about humanizing our cities, about the public health, the individual well-being, feeling of safety, money spent and time wasted. There's a lot of interesting ingredients into transportation, and least but not least, livable environments and modern lifestyle. If I were here uh, two years ago, uh, I would be talking about our great transportation and environment plan in Copenhagen. We made such one, a very thick one, actually, um, covering everything from uh, noise pollution, air pollution, congestion, traffic safety, school travel plans, uh, high capacity of the streets, things like that, all put together into one document trying to get it politically approved. This is very hard to do, probably also in Vancouver, I can imagine. Uh, if you have very large decisions to make, it gets very, very difficult, and you might have to push them several times into the council to get them approved. We learned from this lesson that it might be easier and better and more effective to have sort of smaller packages for political improvements. So now we work the way that we take our packages with a, with a significant uh, headline, and uh, like this one, called the Ecometropolis, talking about our climate policy, and also about to be the center for the world's climate policy. Some of you might know that Copenhagen will be hosting the next uh, UN conference on climate change this December. This is about it. We want to be the world's best city for cyclists, green and blue capital city. This is about green areas and using the water for, for rural recreation, and clean and healthy major city. And these four issues, four topics, is going into one strategy, and we try to get that approved and we succeed. Next strategy for how we want people to use public space and how to be uh, a part of a livable city, we made the Atromedis for People another strategy covering the issues of more urban life for all, more people to walk more, this is the pedestrian issue coming in here, and more people to stay longer. And this was made up and uh, pushed to the uh, council agenda a few months ago and also got approved and now in a public hearing. So this way we're trying to build our strategies in smaller packages instead of the larger and the big and the very heavy ones. Um, the Eco Metropolis has four uh, topics, and one of them is the world's best city for cycling. And each of these topics have separate, concrete, specific goals set for 2015. On the cycling agenda, we have these top three um, goals, which is to have more people to cycle and walk, to uh, half the number of injury cyclists, and to also double the safe feeling of Copenhagen that's on cycle. The other strategy has similar goals on the pedestrian area, trying to, by 2015, to have 80% of Copenhageners will be satisfied with the opportunities they have for taking part in urban life and things like that. I'll be talking mostly about cycling in a little while. Until then, I'll just give you a free, brief overview of what else is happening on the traffic agenda in Copenhagen. 
Some more basic facts. Uh, this is the, the cool facts about the Copenhagen modal split. Um, as you can see, we have a large, nice blue area of bike on foot covering 59% of all trips in Copenhagen. I believe that's as close to be the world record, actually. Uh, about the traffic, uh, the top curve is uh, the car traffic covering the municipality border. As you can see, it is increasing. The blue one in the bottom is the car traffic at the, the center of the city, which is very stable. Might be even be slightly decreasing these years. And if I show you another graph about the cycling, uh, numbers of cyclists crossing the same boundaries, you will have exactly the opposite picture. Cycling is stable on the outskirts and the single boundary, but in the city center, cyclist is increasing. So our traffic policy in short is to have more bikes, more metro, more bus priority, restrictions on private cars, less air pollution, accidents, noise, and CO2 emission. One of our tools is paid parking zones. You have them in Vancouver as well. And they have to prove to be quite effective in terms of keeping the lid on the car traffic, commuting car traffic. We have uh, quite high prices compared to yours um, at paid parking zones. And also we have the, the rule that residents living inside these areas is actually getting the permit quite cheap. Money comes in from uh, paid parking zones actually used to building park places in new construction in the residential areas. And this is about that we like to, like to, to reduce the number of commuting uh, private cars, but at the same time to say, well, you've got to be able to live in the city and have access to a car. The car is not abandoned in, the, in Copenhagen. You're actually able to live there and have a car, but please use your bike. Low emission zones, this is also about humanizing transport. I mean, those small particles from diesel engines get into your lungs. It's really not very healthy, and that's why we do things like this. Congestion charging proposal, we have uh, worked together with 16 neighboring municipalities, drafted this concept of congestion charging, quite similar to one in Stockholm and quite similar to the one in London. Well, we have this uh, problem that on the national level, our government, which is a right conservative uh, government, uh, doesn't want us to have this congestion charging, and we're not allowed to do it without permission from the parliament. So this is the situation. The state of Copenhagen, neighboring municipalities, really want to push for this agenda, but we, not, we haven't handed over for the, for the parliament. Restrictions on heavy traffic trucks, about, about uh, 18 tons. I'll just get very quickly through that. But that was getting interesting, because what are we doing on the streets? Um, traffic trials and traffic experiments uh, has been uh, ongoing in Copenhagen for many years. And we had a lot of uh, good stories about trying to use, to, to show something for real, two or three months, maybe half a year, trying to figure out what's going to happen. And this one on the picture is actually going on right now. Here you see uh, today's situation in uh, Nørrebrogade, which is a uh, main shopping street, main street uh, inter in Copenhagen, about five kilometers long. And uh, what we do right now is that we say, well, if we take this street, we has got a lot of potential for urban living, a lot of, lot of potential for shopping facilities and things like that. If we take this street and we reduce the amount of space we must have to use for the buses, and maybe for very few cars going in, coming out. But all through traffic will be uh, uh, closed and uh, abandoned. If you take the area and use exactly what is needed, then the rest of the space can be used for pedestrians and bicycles. Of course, there's a conflict going on right now. Uh, we have a very heavy dialogue, and I was just emailing some of my people at home that uh, the shopkeepers are really getting angry now. They don't like this because, they, of course, we have to uh, reduce the number of parking places outside their shops. But this is going on now, and uh, this is another picture for the same uh, project. This is part of the street where private cars are not allowed. This is the bus street, a very short uh, stretch of bus street, 100 meters, I think, which actually makes it possible to get rid of old cars. This is how it looks. Uh, traffic trial and traffic experiments have to be built with very cheap materials uh, that be there for several months, and it's not very aesthetic to look at. This is one of our problems. But actually, we, as you can see, we took out one lane, uh, made it a bicycle lane, and the pre what has been the bicycle lane earlier is actually becoming a flex zone, a pedestrian area in this concept. This experiment is uh, running now. It's been running for three months, and we had it for uh, political improvement to prolong it or to stop it. 
and they just managed to uh, to make the uh, the uh, our politicians in favor of uh, of going on with this project in order to make a permanent solution within the summer. But it's a hard fight between the local residents that really likes these concepts and the shopkeepers that really are mad and angry, mm -hmm. to say the least. So traffic experiments uh, has really been an issue for many years, and we have. Uh, the other day in the office, we were talking about what we've been doing and building a new things in Copenhagen. And suddenly, we realized that almost all of our projects had been uh, a traffic experiment earlier. We've been running these trains for uh, for uh, five or six years, been in small packages, large packages. This one, uh, Boca, is actually the largest that we ever did. About our new urban developments, uh, we have uh, the one called Eurostad here, which is quite a long development, as we half built now. Uh, southern Harbour area, Northern Harbour area, and some other places. I will just uh, give you a few brief overview of some of them. Ørestad, uh, this one, is uh, significant in the way that we started off building the light rail or the metro, very similar to your Translink, actually, uh, before anyone moved out there. That was the first thing happening was actually the transit was there. And we made a huge difference on how travel behavior is today. At the same time, we had a new rule out there that we reduced the number of parking cars. They were not allowed to build more than one parking place per 200 square meters. Ambitions on architecture and design is really going through everything that we do in Copenhagen, as you can see here, and also a variety of, of, uh, of, um, uh, of recreational facilities. The very urban-like and the very nature-like is also situated in this, in this uh, urban development. Northern Harbour is the next very large development. It looks like this, and uh, we just had an international co competition about the master plan for this area. And uh, we asked our, uh, the competitors, actually the architects that were uh, making into this context and competition, well, this got to be sustainable. It's got to be CO2 neutral. You've got to make up for the same modal split that we have in the rest of the city. And that's a really hard one to crack. How do you do that when you have a completely new area starting off with more than 59% of all trips done by foot or bike when there's nothing out there. So we'd be excited to see what happens. And uh, actually, I'll just show you uh, three winning projects. They're actually competing now, I've got the contract. Mm -hmm. And this project actually shows how to use a serpentine, a super cycle track serpentine, covered by the metro up here. So you can actually drive there in the rain, the snow without getting wet. So this is actually the backbone of the whole area. This is a super cycle track. Cars are coming in down here, making sort of a secondary entrance to the whole area. This is one way of working. Another way of working is that the, that the areas um, close to, your, to the houses actually shared space area. The first thing you got is your cycle rack. Then you're going to walk a distance to meet the public transport. Then you're going to walk a distance to meet your car in that way. So, those tricks and a lot of other tricks are used for meeting our expectations on, on the travel behavior. Another uh, project is uh, using some other kind of tricks, and uh, I won't go too deep into this. This one is interesting because uh, what they do is actually they make parks covering the edge of the, of the sea, and they have a very high density of uh, environments uh, covered uh, in, in the, in the translic uh, um, in this transnet route, actually. It's a very strong concept, they're very sustainable, actually, when you get into it. We work, actually, very, uh, it's been many years working for the station near principle, meaning that high density close to, to railway stations. You probably know about this. And uh, down here at the harbor, at this place, we have the, the, the ferry to Norway, coming in twice a day. And uh, these projects, uh, development projects here and here, was actually suggested uh, not too long time ago. And uh, the problem is that over here, you have too long a distance to the station, which is over here. You've got to have less than 500 meters to be able to say, I'm stationed there, and you're able to build a high density. So what happened was that the people that developed those projects said, well, how on earth are we going to be stationed there? They did like this. This is the cycle track. So just a cycle track, the 16th story of these two buildings, allowing the ferries in Norway to go out and under it. I'd like to see this happen, actually. I'm not sure it will happen. Okay. The Southern Harbor is more like the, the Holland and Dutch style, getting the water very close to the living rooms and things like that. Also using the water for leisure and active living, of course. Our road network, in very short, 
And if any of you are traffic planners, you will see, well, here something is missing because if they're going to develop this and they're going to develop this and they're going to develop this, they are missing a link out here. So what we are doing is actually starting building, which is a, 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 a road, a new road tunnel, actually, to the northern half out here. And what is going on? We have a new project, a ring metro coming up, starting building it right now. And Nørrebrogade, uh, which I was showing you earlier, this main street is here. And we have several uh, bridges, crossing barriers. Those are both uh, cycling and pedestrian bridges, one covering the harbor, one covering the, one of the main arterial roads in Copenhagen. These uh, four uh, blue dots, I will come to you uh, a little bit later. This is the uh, Northern Harbor Road for uh, environment assessment right now to be approved before summer. About cycling traffic, some more figures. 1.15 million is cycled every day in Copenhagen. 36% is arriving at workplaces or educational places every day in Copenhagen. And 60% of Copenhageners is choosing their bike on all trips. Those are cool facts. Cycle traffic, 50% cycle up to five, 50 kilometers a day, 15% cycles over 100 kilometers a day, and this number is actually increasing. 60% use their bike every day, 85% own some bike, and I could add that 60% of these uh, bikers also bike during winter. About cycle safety, uh, I'm very proud to say actually that we have half, more than half the risk of being a bike in Copenhagen during the last 10 years. But the feeling of safety is not too good. Cyclists is becoming a problem for cyclists. They're actually pushing and saying to each other. And uh, we have two narrow cycle tracks now. So uh, it's really a, a huge demand for widening uh, tracks like this. Also, the sense of safety is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is because of other cycles, because of buses and because of cars also, when we ask about this. So why do Copenhagen a cycle? Some people think, at least also in Copenhagen, that they cycle because of environmental reasons, because of climate change, because of things like that. But that's not true, actually. People in Copenhagen cycle because it's easy, it's convenient, it's fast, it's reliable, it's cheap, things like that. That's the answers that we get. Convenience environment here is at the bottom with 1%. I think I closed this one down. Oh, there it is. Uh, so that's important to understand in Copenhagen that it's so simple part of everyday life to use your bike. It's as simple as putting on your shoes, actually. And I, I would actually tell my neighbor that I was standing here in Vancouver talking to you today about Copenhagen Cycle City. He would be quite surprised. Why? Is it that important? Get it? <laughs> so anyway, to be the world's best city for cycling, our goal for 2015 is that uh, the number of 36 is going to be raised to 50. We will have 50% less in serious injured cyclists and 50% higher sense of safety. That's our goals. And one of the things to do to reach this goal is actually the congestion charging scheme, which will take us along the way, along the way in a very short time, if we are allowed. Anyway. But apart from this, investing in new cycling facilities, new connections, new cycle lanes, new cycle tracks, new green cycle routes, and other projects is a very uh, central part of our strategy also these days. And uh, those proposals, proposals for new investments is not that difficult to make and are not that difficult to have approved. Of course, there's a budget priority inside this, into this, of course. But every time I hit the council, city council, or the, uh, the traffic committee with proposals on new cycle tracks, they all agree, if they got the money. From right wing, left wing, they all agree. They all like it. Why is that? Because it has a lot of brilliant ingredients seen from a political point of view. Uh, less congestion, less spend wasted time on the streets. Everybody can be in favor of that. Better environment, who could be against it? Improve their health, of course, improve your health. Easy to achieve results. This is about, think about politicians and election periods. You can start your election period saying, well, I'm going to be the top number one person driving cycling policy to new heights and you've got to save or produce investments, produce the results, and after two, two and a half, three years, he will be able to show the public, well, I did this, I made this, and it's there, you can see it. So these projects are rather simple compared to many other projects, and it can really be decided and be built, and the result can be seen within a limit of uh, four years, which is the, uh, the political term in Copenhagen. It also has a lot of cheap and visible effects, and you will always have the public opinion in, in, in favor of this. 
Cycle infrastructure means that we have a lot of bicycle tracks and bicycle lanes covering Copenhagen. Uh, all our main street, almost all our main street has uh, dedicated cycle lanes with a curb between the cyclists and the, and the cars, and a lot of other free institutions. But still, that's a lot to do. And uh, we have added this uh, new infrastructure, cycling infrastructure, during the last few years, which is the green cycle routes. Green cycle routes means there's an opportunity for you as a cyclist to go around the city, but not be together with the cars. This is a typically thing, routes that goes through parks, through uh, what has been uh, left over railroad tracks or even cemeteries, things like that. And we managed to make up this plan covering the whole city with 110 kilometers of green bicycle routes. One third of this has been built already. And uh, in the next uh, period of, uh, of financing and budgets, we will have uh, this one built and also this one out here. So this is really growing fast, actually. The green cycle routes also have a high standard of aesthetics. This is putting people, this is also about putting people and humanizing our parks. Cyclist has a lot of, uh, of people, uh, image of people on wheels, like pedestrians, people on shoes. And cyclists bring active, active living and activity into parks, which sometimes has a problem with attracting people into their, into their facilities. So green cycle routes is also seen as an activity inside the parks that really brings the park quality to a high level. Cycle routes crossing arterial route, one of our new bridges, and you can see the same story, high design standard. This is also a result of an architect uh, competition that built by one of our best architects at all in Copenhagen. Developing infrastructure and redesigning crossings. This is one of the tricks that we have been very successful on, talking about traffic safety and reducing the number of casualties. We have, for at least 25 years, complete data of every serious accident in Copenhagen. Every time there's an accident, police makes reports. And in addition to the report, in addition to that, they make sort of a report about the type of accident, what happened, who was crossing, which direction, the age, uh, gender issues, uh, liquor involved, was it early, what time of day, all those kind of data was collected on every single accident for 25 years. This makes us possible that we can actually redesign crossings very effectively and try to prevent new conflicts because we know what happens. We know exactly what's been happening in this cross section, this junction for 25 years, and it's quite easy actually to go into these data to find out, well, where are the conflicts? Where do they make their mistakes that brings accidents? And how can we avoid them? So very similar tools actually. We're able to redesign crossing like this, and we will have uh, it, this project, I think, was about 80% reduction of traffic injuries uh, doing this trick. So those kinds of techniques are very effective and very important to run. So keep on collecting data injuries and your accidents. Another trick, safety blue crossings. We use these blue crossings when we want to raise the awareness about the cyclists. And some about difficult crossings, difficult junctions, with maybe a little bit too many accidents, we use this blue pavement to show, well, expect cyclists to be here. And this way, we're trying to bring up the awareness from the car drivers to, towards the cyclists. And we also has the effect to, use, to show the cyclists, well, now I'm in a blue crossing. Uh, there's some reason for this blue crossing to be here, so I'm going to be going to be more aware than I else would be. But the funny thing is that we made quite a lot of surveys about the effectiveness of these blue, blue pavements. And it showed us to our surprise, actually, that if we have a junction with four blue uh, pavements crossing each corner of the junction, we will have a negative impact on numbers of accidents. If we have one crossing like this one, the result will be positive. So this is about only to use these blue pavements when they are really important. Otherwise, you will have a negative result. Another thing we use very much is to uh, draw back the stop lines for the cars. In crossing, it's important to make the situation in a way that the car driver can see the cyclist when the green light is on. So if we draw back the cars, or set back the cars to this line and have the bicycle here, well, he can see the bicycle. Another way of doing this is actually to have separate uh, small green lights for bicycles that get screened maybe one second or two seconds before the green lights for the cars, so the cyclist is coming, is coming in front of the cars. 
green waves for cyclists. We've been uh, playing around with satellites uh, for some time. And uh, one of the things we do is uh, try to, to make the traffic lights synchronized in a way that you, if you drive 20 kilometers an hour, you will only meet green lights all the way. And 20 kilometers is actually the average speed of sites in Copenhagen. So uh, this, uh, this is actually also from the Bruegel that I was showing you earlier. We have uh, almost five kilometers where you can go as a cyclist and go all the way through the very central part of town without getting a foot to the ground. About health. Humanizing our city means, of course, us to make it uh, healthy, to make uh, transportation a part of your daily activity, to make uh, transportation not only a part of activity, but also maybe a part of the exercise that you should have done, or maybe you don't have time to do in your, in your busy daily life. We made a study about health effects in Copenhagen, and uh, some of the figures came out uh, like this, or the results came out like this. Um, it's the Traffic Tech study called, uh, Traffic Tech is a, it's a Danish consultant company that actually um, has the, uh, the people that earlier were the researchers at the Nesman Road Administration on traffic safety. They're very clever guys, those traffic tech guys. So what came up is that uh, we can see that physically active persons live five years longer than inactive persons. Not surprised. Active persons live period of living with severe illness is four years less than inactive ones. And only 39% of adult Copenhageners live up to the Board of Health's recommended 30 minutes of daily exercise. So this is the situation. So what happens? New cycle tracks, has, this study showed that new cycle tracks on one kilometer of roadway will result in 20% increase of cyclists and 10% fewer cars. But watch out for safety signs because there seems to be a negative problem here. We learned from this study that using bicycle lanes and bicycle tracks not always came out with a positive effect on traffic safety. Definitely not if you didn't take care of the crossings. So what you gain on the, on the streets, you might sell at the crossings. So lessons to be learned here is that when you get into bicycle lanes and bicycle uh, tracks along the long side roads, you should be very careful about how you design your crossings, for that's what the problems are in terms of accidents. Putting all these figures together, we could uh, calculate that if we had a 10% increase in kilometers cycled in Copenhagen, we could see that some of the result would be that healthcare would save us US dollars 10 million annually, annually saving US dollars 28 million due to reduced production loss. Labor market will have a lot of more working days. 61,000 extra years of life, 40,000 fewer years of prolonged severe illness, 25 fewer early retirements. Well, <laughs> it's quite amazing figures to do this uh, kind of calculation. And of course, uh, the method can be discussed. I'm sure it can be discussed. And there's also some, uh, some trade-off effects. Uh, you can probably hear economists say things like this. But anyway, those, these figures are quite convincing. What's the source? The source is uh, the company called Traffic Tech, uh, who made the, uh, this uh, name here who made this uh, study for us two years ago. At the bottom line, one extra kilometer cycle gives an average gain in health and production related benefits of more than five Danish crowns. To say very short. So health effects is really an issue here. And health effect is becoming an issue also in Copenhagen. It has not always been an issue. I mean, cycle tracks and cycle, uh, cycle uh, lanes has been built for many other reasons of health reasons. This just recently came into the agenda. Well, there's something about health, isn't there, and all those bicycles. So I'd be, um, it, it'd be interesting to see what it actually means to have these kind of figures into the discussion as well. On the climate change, we also have some interesting figures because if the climate is cycling in Copenhagen were done by car instead of cycles, we would have something about 90,000 tons of CO2 uh, to, to deal with annually. Well, all our solutions are designed in collaboration and including public opinion. 
this is the good way of doing it and my warmest recommendation of getting very close uh, dialogue with the people living and how to use these uh, kind of facilities. Um, these pictures are from a workshop where they managed, this is Maya Bondam, who's actually the, uh, the technical and environmental uh, uh, mayor for, for Copenhagen right now, and a really hard core uh, science enthusiast. He managed to get a budget of 75 Danish million crowns, and he managed to get in the budget without having any names, any projects signed to it. So he was able to call up and say, well, call on all our citizens, say, I got 75 million Danish crowns, how am I going to spend it? So we made up workshops, called for projects and put ideas, and it was actually a very good success, as you can see here. A lot of people working on the maps of Copenhagen, trying to find out, well, what's the most important thing to do if you want to have more sites in Copenhagen. Another way of being on the street uh, is our campaign activities. This one is what we call the phaser activities, meaning that we hire, I think it was uh, 30 uh, young people in red jackets going to the street, stopping the cyclists, say, well, how do you feel about being a cyclist today? Can you give a few ideas about how could it be even better, or how are you, are you missing something here, or how is your comfort, actually? And this direct dialogue between two people on the street is giving you a new, brand new flavor to the public dialogue about cycling. In addition to this, uh, the people that were stopped on the street they went home to the dinner table and telling about this story about, well, I was stopped today by a guy from the municipality asking me about the cycling conditions. That's a good story. And this story goes like rounds in the, in the city and makes a lot of good attention to what it really is about namely building a bicycle culture in, in the positive way. We also have uh, campaigns like this one. Uh, this is about Helmholtz. You can probably see that without reading the, reading the text. And uh, our annually uh, Bike into Work campaign is becoming very popular. It's a brilliant idea to have workplaces to compete against each other about how many people in our workplaces are actually using our site in this week and they get awards, and they have funny events uh, running around this campaign. And one of them is actually the launch campaign. A few weeks before we start this, we had this uh, event going on uh, where we're stopping uh, all people, all the bikes on the uh, Archiva roads in Copenhagen and handing out morning roads to them, just saying, good morning, I'm so happy that you took your bike today. And these kind of events are very popular, and people are actually smiling, at least as much as she's doing, not because I'm standing there, but uh, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I don't uh, and anyway, and also, this is a very enthusiastic mayor on the street, the same thing. And this, what, what really is important about this is that you have to build up events to attract attention from media. If you've got media, you've got politicians. If you've got politicians, you've got media. Things like that. <laughs> so that's a very important trick to make up events about the cycling culture, to keep it alive, keep the attention, keep the awareness about how important it is that we, that we still uh, develop our biking culture in, uh, in Copenhagen. This is a, from a training course for an immigrant uh, that is coming to Copenhagen without having the background and not having learned how to bike as, uh, as youngsters. We have training courses for them uh, and uh, competing, of course, in awards and everything that goes like it. This iBike CPH is actually the, the logo that we are trying to brand all our activities in. Uh, it seems that the recognizing this, uh, this logo is actually bringing more results around campaigning activities than else. So we try to do this, to use this iBike CPH in any events possible. This is the, uh, the cycle bus, and the idea is that uh, long distance commuters can be very lonely. But uh, if they sort of make appointments about where they're going to start in the morning or where they're going to be the next stop and the next stop, almost like a timetable for a bus, they will just meet each other and enjoy each other's company on the way to work. Our bike CPH, we have a homepage on this uh, uh, as, as well, trying to build up sort of a social platform without, have the, without having the municipality as, as the owner of this platform. We have designed it, we have paid for it, we have launched it, now it's going to live for itself, and hopefully, I will cross my fingers, that it will be very much alive discussing uh, the biking culture of Copenhagen. Partnerships about campaigning, this is about uh, one of our really uh, hard challenges. We have some, not very high numbers, but some very severe accidents on right-turning trucks in front of bicycles. 
And each time this happens, these very nasty accidents. Uh, so we're really going to fight them very uh, focused in partnerships with the, with the truck law and lorry uh, organizations. But campaigning has very different kinds of uh, shapes and uh, forms in Copenhagen. I think it's very important to keep up the pace on, the, on, on campaigning activities. This one is actually about having school children to map their safety on the way to school. Um, of course, if you can make people, or make children safe feeling uh, good enough to choose their bike, in addition to this, have their parents to feel safe about their children going to school on bikes. You have to do something about safe feeling. And what we did here was actually to ask children from two schools, or four schools actually, uh, to map their feeling of safety on the internet web browser, telling us exactly where do I feel safe, where do I feel unsafe on the way to school. And then we get pictures like this that makes us able to say, well, we've got to do something here because here's a red dot. This crossing is not all right. We've got to do something about that. Traveling patterns on the schools in the outskirts, schools in the central part of the city, the blue one is walking, the red one is biking. Not surprisingly, it has a little bit more, or quite a lot more actually, biking in the outskirts of the municipality. And in the very high dense areas, with short distances, we have more uh, foot on, to foot on or on bike. Same projects. Now, monitoring measuring is very important. Um, not only to see, are we getting somewhere? But, uh, but we are also uh, want to know for every second year exactly how are we doing on key figures, how are we doing on the policy target figures, and what do people think. Every second year we ask 1,000 Copenhageners about a lot of questions about bicycles, and we compare them to the previous one and the previous one, and now we have actually seven. The eighth one is coming up next week, I think, or two weeks from now, uh, showing us how are we developing on all these uh, issues. And uh, just to mention a few of these, this question is about the general question about Copenhagen as a city for cyclists. How do you feel about Copenhagen as a city for cyclists? As you can see, there's been proving very, very good, very high level, 10 is the top level, and the next one must actually be nine. I'm very proud of that. The amount of cycle tracks is also uh, very stable. The, the width of a cycle track has actually been decreasing. The great number of cyclists also means that there's more um, wishes for wider cycle tracks all over the city. And I was mentioning that the safe feeling, uh, here it is, cyclist sense of safety, has also been decreasing. In our next bicycle account coming up a few weeks from now, the figures would change like this. We will have this one up to a nine. We'll have a slightly decrease in cycle track width, and also the feasibility of combining cycling and public transport will go down to five again. But in the end, I think every decision that we take as human beings that we do not really calculate or think about, we take with our feelings in front. So the feeling of being a cyclist, the feeling of the lifestyle that you actually are showing or are part of when you're being a cyclist, may be not underestimated when you ask the people of why do they choose their bikes. So the whole cultural thing is where we are actually getting into right now in Copenhagen, trying to figure out what is this culture thing? Why is this so trendy? And I think it's quite trendy to be a bicycle in Copenhagen. We can see it on the streets. What makes it trendy? And are we able to get into these, this area of work, trying to prolong it and trying to enhance what's really attractive by Copenhagen? The last pictures here will uh, speak for themselves. Uh, as you can see, we have a brilliant photographer in the office. But this is actually pictures taken on the streets in Copenhagen, trying to show you some of the uh, the spirit and the, and the style of cycle traffic in, the, in Copenhagen that really makes it attractive and, and trendy and liberal and a humanized city. This was actually uh, what I had prepared for you as presentation and uh, should we take some questions and comments and uh, discussion on top of this? Bus passengers and cycle lanes in Nabucco. What you're trying to do is actually to have, um, what's the English word for that? I think we call it an island, which means that when you come to the bus and you're leaving the bus, you're stepping out on a sort of an island for bus passengers. Then you're there, then you have, secondly, to cross the cycle lane. You're not standing on the cycle lane. 
And as a bus passenger, if you want to get on the bus, you, have, you can quietly and easily cross the cycle lane, stepping out to this island, and there you will wait for the bus. So the conflict between the bus passengers and the cyclists is not there anymore. But usually we have actually the situation where, or previously we had the situation where the bus is actually driving into the curb of the bicycle track, and all the bus passengers will step out directly on the bicycle track or wait on the bicycle track for the bus to come. And that creates conflicts between the cyclist and the bus passenger. In addition to this, we have some very nice figures uh, on the issue of that we are actually saving time for the buses. We're saving a lot of time for the buses because they don't have to wait for passengers to cross the cycle track to get into the bus. They're actually ready when the bus is there. And only a few seconds and, and minutes in, in, in bus time is actually quite a lot of money. So we calculated that on this project, this traffic trial in Brugel, we have saved uh, uh, something like three million Danish crowns annually on the bus budget only on this on this street. There's quite a lot of money involved here. Yes? Other questions? Uh, most of your bike lanes on the main streets, are they segregated? So there's a curb, some kind of separation between the cyclist and the car? There's not just a line of paint? Yes, we, um, the best solution, to be, to be honest, is actually to have a curb between the bicycles and the cars. And they usually always build cycle tracks with a curb. There are exceptions to that. Uh, Mostly if we really have problems with the width, because the cycle lane with the paint is a little bit narrow, can be made a little bit narrower than the, than the cycle track with the curb. But usually we only build cycle tracks with curbs. Really. Hmm. Expensive, but the best solution. Sure. Thanks. Yeah, um, in, in our region, uh, driving and uh, fuel consumption is static or perhaps declining in the center of the city and increasing in the outskirts of the city, um, the, the metropolitan region. And it, it seemed from what you were, were portraying, you have the same situation there. So I, I, have, I have two questions. Um, for the general, for the whole urban region, how much money are you spending expanding roads and freeways and that tunnel that you showed and how much are you spending on cycling infrastructure? And the other question is, what's happening with your greenhouse gas emissions from transportation in the whole metropolitan region? The first question, I'm not sure if I can give you exact figures, but uh, within the city boundaries, we spend a lot between something between 10 and $20 million uh, every year on bicycle facilities. On top of that, we uh, sometimes we build bridges, which are quite expensive, actually. Um, when you're asking about the investment in, in the whole region, uh, for, for instance, for, for a new harbor tunnel or, or the metro city ring, things like that, you have to double this figure about at least 100. I mean, investment in bicycles is, is still very, very small proportion compared to the investment in, in the rest of the infrastructure. But I will add to this that right now we're actually drafting our uh, climate plan for Copenhagen. We have set some very ambitious goals. We want to be the front runner city that we're going to host the COP15 conference this year. So we set very ambitious goals and we're now actually drafting the strategies on how to get there. And it seems for our calculations that uh, transport has got a lot of things to offer here. We could get a lot of our CO2 emissions cut down by investing heavily in cycling infrastructure and things like that. So last night, you must not mention that, this to anyone, but last night actually I was uh, mailing with my, with my uh, mayor and the CO2 and the CEO actually about this issue because I was, I've been proposing, proposing this, uh, that we should put an extra zero actually to the amount of money we spend on the bicycle infrastructure these years in order to get uh, the, the curve uh, go up like we really want it to. That's what we're, how we're going to do it. And of course, it makes a discussion about, well, it's too much money you're asking for, Nils. I said, well, yes, but compared to Metro City Line or, or the Northern Harbor Tunnel or whatever we're going to build, this is not a lot of money. And the effect is actually quite convincing. Hi, Fred Margell. Um, what I'm going to ask you is, it sounds like a bit of a housekeeping matter, but I was in Copenhagen uh, last summer, uh, for example, around the uh, the central 
train station. There must have been 50,000 bicycles piled on top of each other, tied to the fence somehow. If I had a bicycle in there, I wouldn't know how to find it if it was still there when I got back to where I thought my bicycle was. So my, so do you have anything to say about your planning thoughts about uh, storage, both in public spaces and planning for and mandating private space allocated to storage? Mm. And, it, and, uh, you know, and is theft a serious problem in the bicycle culture? The answer to your last question is that compared to many other cities, that is not really a big problem in Copenhagen. So can I, can, I, can I pose something? Is it, uh, is, um, I suspect that people spend a lot less money on their bicycle than the average uh, Vancouverite might spend. Does that, I, you've probably seen bicycles around town with that. I think um, compared, to, uh, for instance, compared to Dutch cities like Amsterdam and Groningen and things like that, you will see much more uh, delicious super bikes in Copenhagen than you will in, in really? Amsterdam. Really? Yeah. We are spending more money on our bikes. We have more gears and aluminium and things like that. Uh, if you go to Dutch cities, you will see rather uh, cheaper bikes, uh, yeah. more uh, used bikes, because well, they, have, they have a quite a lot of the theft problem in, in, in Holland, much larger than we have. But um, to your first question about bicycle parking, that's a, t that's a tough one, actually, and we haven't, we haven't solved this problem. We're trying to do several things, but uh, we have a lot of, of, of uh, bike pass, uh, parked bikes in Copenhagen that's really creating a mess in our urban, uh, in our urban space. What we do is actually we are putting new bicycle racks. We put in uh, about 5,000 new racks uh, during the last three months. Uh, we have put, uh, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Um, we are trying to develop uh, automatic parking facilities, you probably know about them, uh, to put in the right places. They're quite expensive, but could be interesting to some, uh, some uh, interesting places. We are trying to build a new parking uh, facility in the back side of the central station. It's probably where you've been and seen this mess. And uh, we also try to apply for permission that we could actually take illegally parked or very silly parked uh, bicycles and move them into bicycle racks or even take them away in order to the owner to have to pay for it to get it back. But this must have permission from the Minister of Justice to do these kind of things in Copenhagen, and we won't get this permission, to, uh, haven't got it until yet, actually, but we're still waiting for it. So we're trying to do several things, but to be honest, I don't think I can say that we've solved the problem of biking, uh, of park bike in Copenhagen. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for a most interesting talk. Uh, this isn't about bicycling, though. It's about uh, transit, because you said that you were building more transit in uh, Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. And uh, one slide that you showed showed an elevated uh, uh, train line, very sim it appeared very similar to our SkyTrain system. And I was wondering if there, if there are urban design implications uh, either under uh, the supports for those uh, for the line or on either side where there's a wrong side of the tracks for, ex for example are there social uh, and urban design issues associated with with building elevated lines I'm not sure I understand your question actually did, did you say social Oops. yes if a for example uh, there's a widespread uh, feeling that when you put an, an elevated transit line in, that it creates a barrier between uh, uh, communities on either side or portions of communities on either side, and that one of the communities may deteriorate as a result and become less desirable, less mm -hmm. economically viable, a poor community. Are there issues like that in, uh, uh, with elevated lines in Copenhagen? There are issues, and there have been discussions about these uh, metro lines, um, mostly about uh, we have, a, 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 in, in a period, a metro line, uh, the last one we built, actually, that was partly put to the ground, but it's still in an open, sort of an open construction. And that creates really a barrier, and was quite annoying, a lot of local pressure to have it on the ground, or down to the ground, underground, or maybe elevated uh, to get rid of the barrier. Uh, of course, the elevator construction is also uh, having a barrier effect, uh, but not as similar or nor not as significant as, as the one on the ground. But um, the Copenhagen Metro, or light rail, as I used to call it, is, is uh, driverless. That's the one you got here in, in, uh, hmm. in Vancouver. 
So it goes under the city in the, in the dense areas in the central part of the city, and it goes up on top in the elevated uh, uh, way that you saw in the pictures when it goes to the outskirts. That how, that's how it works. The new ring metro will be underground all the way around. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the inspiring talk. I'm curious with all your successes in becoming a city of cyclists and a critical mass of cyclists, are you starting to see changes in what people demand or ask for their land use? Are you seeing changes in housing types from all these mass cycles that are creating a wonderful new market? Yes, we do actually. We see uh, more demand for uh, in-house bicycle parking in our new developments. Mm -hmm. I mean, actually, and I was asking for in our new planning concepts that uh, it should be mandatory for developers to have a number of bicycle racks into their facilities uh, in order to get their allowance for, for building mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, we also see a huge demand for, for more, more bicycle tracks and wider bicycle tracks has really become an issue for the last few years because people are actually getting annoyed about pushing into each other mm -hmm. in, in the morning traffic. So. Those kind of those kind of issues are really is really coming up now. Are, but are, is the is the market the, uh, similar? Is it the same roughly types of densities, types of housing, uh, types of communities? Are you starting to see any shift? No. You already have a traditional fabric that accommodates cycling mm -hmm. really well. But wondering if there's any changes now that. Not that I'm aware of, actually. Uh, you know, as I was saying before, using a bike in Copenhagen is as simple as taking on your shoes. It's really. <laughs> It's really sometimes difficult to see the patterns of what is changing and not changing if we're not actually monitoring it, and we are not. Hi there. Um, one thing I've heard talking with a number of folks, uh, I guess from various municipalities in uh, the lower mainland here, is when I ask why aren't they investing more in bicycle infrastructure, they'll say, well, biking comprises such a low proportion of the mode share here. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the evolution of mm. uh, Copenhagen's mode share and how infrastructure may have affected that, and also about the any political uh, battles I suppose you had over the course of the years in mm. um, implementing costly infrastructure. Mm. Actually, uh, the, the situation in Copenhagen has been developed over 80 or 100 years, actually. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to explain the story, exactly what happened when and, and things like that. Yeah. One central issue, I think, to explain the development is actually that we do not have a car manufacturing lobby in Denmark. <laughs> that might be an issue. I know I cannot, uh, it's not a research result, but it's just a statement that we don't have these kind of things in Copenhagen, and they don't have in Holland as well. Mm -hmm. But I think I can say that it's been a change in terms of what people, what kind of facilities people demand. Um, usually, um, say 10 or 15 years ago, to be a bicyclist was sort of a, a very enthusiastic thing to do. You were actually very uh, courageous, uh, right way of thinking, uh, enthusiastic about the bikes in order to, to, to use the bike as a daily means of transport. But nowadays, biking has become for everyone. I mean, the average uh, profile for a bicyclist in Copenhagen is very similar to the average profile of our citizens. Hmm. So it means that when we are building new bicycle tracks, uh, we are building for everyone. And we are trying to build with a high standard that meets the expectations you have as a modern citizen in a, in a very uh, a good city as, as Copenhagen and a prosperous city like Copenhagen. And I think from what I've seen in Vancouver, you might be even trying to check these steps about, now we're not only building for enthusiast uh, bicycle riders and, and the courageous one, now you're trying to build for ordinary people mm -hmm. using really uh, nice and, and complete designs, actually streets that are built for bikes and not only the, the pavement on the streets, which can be very good in some situations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have uh, two questions at probably uh, opposite ends of the scale. One is uh, the most interesting thing to me tonight is that you're a landscape architect by profession and that you're uh, basically shaping a city through transportation and alternative transportation modes. I'd like to hear a little bit more about that uh, and how it came about. The other end is a, just a, a detailed thing. What are some dimensions of, of on-street facilities for bikes and stuff like that? If you could get, talk about that high-level thing and mm. perhaps a couple of dimensional things for us to take away. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, okay. Uh, the reason why I was showing the slide in the beginning about the ingredients of, of a transportation policy in Copenhagen covering something like everything from livable communities to, to health issues to 
uh, to mobility, of course, and also to, to the image of the city. That is actually one of the answers to why do a landscape architect like me go, uh, become the traffic director of Copenhagen? Because traffic is an issue that goes into every kind of decision in the city. Every kind of development, every kind of planning decision, every kind of daily life actually about traffic lights or, or traffic safety or accidents. You're always dealing with a lot of issues that is, has got to do with human beings and uh, human living, and which is actually the core business of landscape architecture as well. So for this reason, I find it very interesting uh, to, to deal with these things, actually. Uh, becoming a traffic director is also an issue about uh, having learned uh, to become a, a leader, which I've actually learned in the National Road Administration. I became the leader of a traffic and environment department. And, uh, to, have a, to be leading other people to make results is actually a discipline or, 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 or skill that you can use for a living. And that's actually what I'm doing today. But just luckily that uh, combined with being a landscape architect and dealing with traffic is really a very nice situation, a very interesting one, even traveling to Vancouver. Yeah. <laughs> and the width of the sizes of the dimensions of our, our constructions is, the standard width of a bicycle track in Copenhagen is two meters and 20 centimeters. Um, we can go down to 1.7 meters uh, if we're really getting a pressure from, from other kind of construct constructions in, 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 the, in the profiles, uh, but not, not less than that. Uh, sometimes we make, if we have difficult, really difficult situations where we have maybe only 1.5 meters to do with, we usually make bicycle paths with paints because they have a little bit uh, uh, better, con better facilities actually in the very narrow uh, uh, situations. But usually we build from 2,000, uh, two meters and two and, and upwards. Inside the curves. Inside yeah. the That's from curb to curb. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There are curbs between the cars and the bicycles and there are always a curb between the bicycle and pedestrians as well, both sides. Okay. More questions? Hi, Niels. I'm Melody. I'm with the bike study, the Hi. cycling injury study. We met on the street yesterday. Yes, we did, yes. Um, I, just, I was curious if you could comment on the speed that you see the difference in speed between the cyclists in Copenhagen who wear skirts and high heels and you know, mm. uh, travel in large groups compared to here mm. with a kind of more spandex, mm. speedy nature, and whether or not that's um, you know, affecting the kind of injuries that we might be having here. And um, related to that, you said there are curbs between cyclists and pedestrians. Uh, but some of your green um, cycle tracks, it looked like pedestrians and cyclists were together. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if there are a lot of injuries there mm -hmm. with, between cyclists and pedestrians. Mm -hmm. uh, the injuries we have between uh, cyclists and pedestrians is usually on the bus stops. That's the big conflict. Um, about the speed, we have never uh, seen any significant uh, results about comparing speeds uh, on different stretches and, and the number of accidents. No, we don't, I don't have any figures on that. I think you would say that uh, the, the average speed in Copenhagen is uh, usually, we say, 20 kilometers an hour if you have a free ride. Um, but I think a lot of, a lot of people actually go uh, a more, much more relaxed way. Uh, and that's maybe something that has been coming up for the last few years that we have more people trying to, uh, I don't have to hurry on my bike. I mean, it can really be a very relaxing way of transportation. You don't have to, to get sweaty or to have the uh, certain kind of sports clothes on to go on a bike. You can do it like this. I do it like this every day. I go eight kilometers. I mean, I don't how have to how was your experience cycling here yesterday? It was brilliant. It was very interesting. Yes. Sure. You have a lot of good facilities. Of course, the situation in Vancouver is much different from Copenhagen, and, uh, but I see a really, really nice solution coming up and really enthusiastic people working with these things, I'm sure. Thanks. Hi. Um, Hi. My question is about wintertime. Uh, in Vancouver, we are lucky we don't have a lot of snow, but in the rest of the country, our winters are very long and uh, full of snow. Mm. Um, for your city, uh, how does snow affect your ridership? Mm. And what have you done to um, address safety concerns of snow? Mm -hmm. We have uh, measured that 60% uh, of all our uh, commuter bikers is also commuting during winter. So quite a high number is actually uh, riding bikes through winter time as well. What we do is, uh, one simple thing to do is actually, when we remove the snow, 
when there's snow. You start removing the snow on the cycle tracks. First priority. <laughs> Because bikes are much more sensible to snow and to ice, of course. It's quite simple. Hi. Uh, this is a question about your green cycle routes. I noticed that you had a beautiful uh, set of uh, furnishings, the lighting, uh, and, and things like that. It's some sort of interesting looking markers that mm. had signage combined. And, uh, uh, some of us landscape architects would like to see a little more about that, but I wonder if you could describe that and just talk about whether you had any challenges getting um, d people to spend money on quality furnishings and amenities. Um, the, the signpost that, you actually, that you're seeing has been a very long, very expensive, very difficult project. <laughs> Uh, for the same reason, probably. It, it's quite expensive. But the, we say that, well, in the city of Copenhagen, all streets, all main roads have a name and a story, and the people know exactly where Nørrebroke is, and they're having pictures in their head when they say Nørrebroke. We're trying to build the same kind of concept on our green side with networks. We're giving the roads names, uh, names that create pictures in your head that, that you will recognize. Uh, building stories about these names and using these signposts actually to, to, uh, to make as, 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 as road names actually. Trying to build the infrastructure with the same kind of, of uh, that you will recognize it inside your head and have the anatomy in your head living in the city uh, for these green, green uh, cycle route networks. So of course it's an issue to use money on these kind of things but as I said before it's important for us that we make the sign for cyclists, we make the sign at the same level as if you were building houses. I mean, there's no uh, discount solutions here. That's the policy. Great, thank yeah. you. Hi, um, I was just wondering um, about your opinion on a um, public bike system or similar to, I guess, the Paris Vélo Liberté. Mm -hmm. um, is it worthwhile to be spending? on that Metro Vancouver, and has Copenhagen taken initiatives to, I guess, kind of build such a similar infrastructure system? Yep. Um, we already have one uh, public bike system, which is quite old now and quite simple, and it's mostly for tourists, actually. Copenhageners do not use them. And the situation is that in Copenhagen, each, each of us has at least one bike. I mean, we don't need uh, public bikes in order to facilitate us. But we have actually developed, uh, or trying to develop right now, a concept uh, for the, that aims at commuters coming in on trains, long distance commuters coming on trains, that just need a bike to go from the train station to my workplace, maybe a very short distance. And it could be a nice thing if the station was, uh, if the, at the station was a reliable uh, public bike that I was sure it was there when I got there, I could take it, and I could leave it when I get home. So we're trying to build a concept uh, that has this commuter rail uh, uh, purpose, but I'm not, today I'm not actually sure this will happen because it seems to me that from the discussions that we're having at home, it, it will be quite expensive actually. In the city of Vancouver, uh, it could be very interesting. You've seen the, some of the concept running in uh, Paris, in Lyon, um, Vienna, in Munich. Uh, different kind of concepts, but very interesting kind of concepts, and all of them has uh, uh, a very, you should be aware of the very complex uh, financial background these systems has, and they really calculate, well, how expensive is it really? And I think you'll be surprised about how expensive it actually is. So be careful about the, about the money issue here. Maybe you can solve it. Other people have, have done that. I don't know. Why don't you Besides, go this way? There's <laughs> more over here. Okay. Just a, just a quick question. Um, uh, my name is Michael Mortensen, and I uh, live in Vancouver, cycle to work every day. And just, I had that question, I think, a, a, an earlier uh, person had asked, you know, what, what is your experience of cycling in Vancouver? Um, I think the city's done a great job of adding a lot uh, more cycling lanes and the segregated cycling lanes through the downtown in particular, new, new greenway routes. The big issue, of course, is the Burrard Bridge. Mm -hmm. And have, have you, are you aware of that issue? Have you cycled the bridge? And, and do you have any thoughts on it? Well, the guys that took me on the trip yesterday, they took me to, to this bridge and uh, we talked about the issue there as well. And uh, it's a very interesting challenge for the city to see, actually, too, <laughs> I can imagine. 
What I was thinking actually was without knowing very much about the traffic uh, patterns here across the bridge. I know that the numbers of the cars is about 60 or 70,000 uh, cars running across this bridge every day and you have a six lane bridge. Uh, so if you take out lanes in order to build in bicycle facilities, you might be very, you might be surprised about the problems that you get or you might not be surprised about the problems that you get. What I would do, if this was in Copenhagen, I think I will, I would think I will start up maybe tomorrow or the day after tomorrow to just put a signpost and make some maintenance work in one of these lanes. <laughs> <laughs> just in order to get the impression what really happens, because you can do a lot about uh, calculating traffic using traffic models and traffic uh, monitoring and traffic uh, figures to quite a sort of what is going to happen if I do like this, and you get a, a certain kind of results. But in a very um, complicated traffic situation in downtown areas with a lot of crossing traffic, it can be very difficult to get these figures right. So a very simple thing to do is actually to try it out. And before making the large trial and investing a lot of money in, the, in making a trial about taking out lanes here to building facilities, simple tricks like this could actually give you some idea, well, which, which part of the town will suffer the most and things like that. Mm. That's one way of working. Maybe it could be take out lanes and uh, maybe the, the problem is not that big. Another way of thinking is probably more to the Copenhagen spirit, I would say, that uh, you have a, a bridge with a very, very steep uh, slope and you, because ships are going under. Um, but it's not very feasible for a cyclist. I mean, you have to go all the way up and all the way down. So why not build bicycle bridges on the lower level, crossing the, city, crossing the harbor directly? You get another kind of problem, uh, of course, crossing boats that you have to solve. But there might be a solution that is worthwhile to looking into, I think. And then, then again, you will have a, a, a bridge which might be only for cyclists and pedestrians, like the Green Cycle Road Network. This is a very attractive in Copenhagen. So there are different options here, and uh, you have to work uh, cautiously about both of them, I think, and try, try it out. Yes. Yeah. Traffic experiments is a wonderful thing. You should do it more. <laughs> really. I'd like to thank you for your very practical ideas like this one just before, and, and a great presentation. I, when I, I'm noodling on this change between two to three percent mode share that our bikes have, I think roughly here, and the 59 percent that you have in Copenhagen, and 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 when I'm, I'm trying to think of what's different here from there, and the only thing that I think we've got about 10 percent of our jobs are in the in the central part of the city, and maybe a little bit less than that in some of the town centers. Is there a real concentration of jobs in Copenhagen that that brings that mode share up and? Uh, how important is that? What policies do you have to encourage that? To be honest, I, I can kind of give you an exact answer to that question. I think from what I uh, feel I've seen in being in Vancouver for the last few days, you have probably a higher concentration of workplaces in the downtown area than we have in Copenhagen because of the high rises. We don't have any high rises in Copenhagen. So, um, and what I've seen is also that I think that the, from the numbers I, I was talking to you guys yesterday, at, that the average length of a bicycle um, trip in Copenhagen is about three kilometers, which is actually very similar to the one you got in, Co in, in Vancouver. So I'm actually not sure about what the, what, what, the, what the differences is, and I'm not able to explain to you how on earth we are going to 36% arriving workplaces when you have so less than him. It's about culture, it's about development things. I, I have not the exact answer to this, okay. I'm afraid. Hi, thank you very much as well. Um, I had a question about children cycling in Copenhagen mm -hmm. and just wondering what sort of efforts you make um, in that area and, and looking at some of the statistics and so on and data that you're collecting, it looks like you're looking at um, biking to work and education and then the, the question of safety and perceived safety and I, I believe there was something about per parents and parental perceived safety, just wondering what's happening there and, and what avenues you're taking to increase um, cycling with children. Mm -hmm. um, the tradition is in, uh, in Denmark and in Copenhagen that uh, usually you learn to ride a bike by your parent. Uh, we don't have, I know some schools have some courses of biking, uh, but it's not really a, a common thing to have. Um, in the beginning of the school year, we are running campaigns uh, all over the whole country in order to, uh, to have uh, the kids to, uh, to 
follow, uh, parents to follow their kids to school on bikes. Uh, and other kinds of campaigns similar to that one. But uh, apart from that, not really is in, anything uh, going on otherwise than just keep asking and keep telling people that, uh, well, you've got to do, uh, got to take your children to school on bikes instead of driving their cars. Um, we have also had some uh, suggestions and proposals about having car-free areas around the schools. We haven't tried that for real yet, uh, but I think we will in the future. Um, and, and things, we also have a concept of uh, having um, um, parking forbidden or stopping forbidden uh, close to the schools during the, uh, between eight and nine in the morning, for instance, in order to, to abandon cars or stopping cars in the, to the schools. So things like that, but it's not really in a large scale, the small, small projects that we want. I wonder if you've had uh, any experience in Copenhagen with electric vehicles, specifically uh, bicycle classified electric mopeds and scooters that mm -hmm. might run mm -hmm. in your bicycle tracks. We haven't seen those yet, mm. to be honest. But I think they will be there. And I think there's a very interesting discussion about what kind of um, uh, what should be allowed for these kind? Are they actually allowed to be on the cycle tracks? Or should they be together with the, with the cars? Personally, I think they might have some very interesting features and they will probably attract people, uh, elderly people maybe, or people that are not uh, able to, or not have the physics right to ride the bikes. So it could be very interesting to see them coming to Copenhagen as well. But I haven't seen them yet. Another quick one, if I may. Um, my perception living in a, a favorable postal code in Vancouver uh, and looking at the demographic of drivers in my neighborhood as I ride by on my bicycle is that perhaps one of the biggest challenges getting them out of their cars is uh, the role of ego and vanity in the role of the car in self-identity. Mm. Um, can, you, can you speak to that at all? We have an interesting experience with one of our traffic trials. I really recommend traffic trials. You've got to do that. Uh, one is that um, um, we sort of two years ago we closed the city center, the medieval city center for cars, just as a traffic trial. One month, no cars. Interesting experiment. One of the things that happens is that one of the people that, uh, or some people, thought, well, okay, I'm going to take my bike. I have only three, four kilometers to work. I'm going to take my bike instead of this, uh, in this, in this, uh, take my car into this zone. And what happens is that if you have very um, loyal uh, car users that's been driving cars all their, all their life and uh, won't ever get out of their cars. If they just try to go on a bike for one week or two weeks, they will really experience the well-being, uh, the advances that you actually get for being on a bike. So it's, much of this is actually about trying and the power of the good example. You have to get on your bike and try it. And even the, the most hardcore car drivers a lot of them was actually be convinced about, well, it's not that bad. It might even be quite funny. It might even be improve my well-being. I might even be getting my exercise that I elsewhere I didn't when, would do things like that. So it's quite convincing. Traffic trials and the power of the good example is really worthwhile using. Thank you. Hi. In your uh, answer to an earlier question, you said that whenever you provide a new cycle facility, you always, you generally try and make it a cycle track, and you just said that it just works best. Mm -hmm. Could you give me some of the reasons why you feel that the cycle track works best? One important reason is that it creates more safety or safe feeling, especially safe feeling and comfort. Uh, that's what uh, the citizens of Copenhagen are asking for. They're asking for comfort, they're asking for safe feeling. And, um, and, uh, and, and also, of course, of the, the right away as you saw, that, the, that the bicycle track gives uh, the bicycle. Uh, bicycle lanes seemed like an, a, a cheap and, uh, and a discount solution that is not really as good as anything else. So we are building bicycle tracks uh, all the time. Okay, because a couple of things you've mentioned with uh, cycle tracks are conflicts at the bus stops and conflicts at the intersections. Mm -hmm. So, and these are the, some of the things that I worry about when I think about designing them here. So, while it's increased the perception of safety, do they actually increase safety, actual safety? That's a very good question, because uh, from the survey that we did a few years ago, we were looking at all our uh, all the built lanes and tracks we made for I think it was ten years or things like that, 
and we measured what was happening before the new construction and after new construction. And what came out was some kind of, some of the figures were actually quite surprising because it showed that our bicycle lanes, just paved lanes on, on the Aspo, didn't create any, si in, any safety and that did not create any safe feeling. The bicycle tracks, even the bicycle tracks came out, some of them negatively on, on accidents, numbers of accidents, but they do create safe feeling. But what actually was most uh, important is that the real issue on accidents and traffic safety are the crossings. You've got to be very careful about the crossings. You've got to really learn how to design these crossings in order to, to reduce the conflicts. And actually, one good trick is to make it look a little bit more dangerous than it actually is. Okay, thanks for the tip. <laughs> Hi, my question is about bicycle helmets, and I noticed there, are some, there were some children wearing helmets. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I saw any adults wearing helmets. Mm -hmm. um, here in Vancouver, there's a law that all cyclists are required to wear helmets, and some do and some don't. Mm -hmm. But from your experience, um, could you comment on bicycle helmets in terms of improving of safety and uh, what effect it might have on ridership? Um, the, this, this is an ongoing discussion in Copenhagen as well and in Denmark as well because we don't have this law. It's not mandatory to use a helmet in Denmark. And uh, the, the use of helmets, is, I think something between 10 and 15% of bikers use helmets in Copenhagen, not anymore. Uh, and of course, there's no doubt about that. If you, if you fall on your bike and you hit the ground, the helmet is really a crucial factor uh, in, in, in terms of injury or the severeness of the injury. Um, it has been discussed uh, if we should have this law to make it mandatory to use bike helmets in Denmark. And uh, there, are much, there are many feelings involved here because um, being 13 years, 15 years, 20 years, 40 years, it's very important how your hair looks. I mean, <laughs> and, and this style issue is really is really a hard one uh, uh, to talk to and to, to to discuss because many people will not wear helmet even if they ought to, or even if it's mandatory. So if we the discussion is actually if we make it mandatory to use helmet by law, we will probably lose a lot of bicycles, and that's the issue. And we also made some calculations some years ago about well, how many bicycles would we actually use if it was made mandatory. And from these calculations, we could clearly see that the, that the revenue that we get from less injuries was less than the amount of health that we get from having many bikers. So this is a rather cool economic decision, this one, but, but it's, it's into, into discussion as well. But I think actually most of it is, is about feelings, it's about Bicycle culture is also a culture where you can sometimes you call bikes the kids in traffic. They don't always do what they tell them to. But you have a very high level of freedom being a bicycle, and getting this thing on your head is, uh, is not comparable to this freedom feeling. But I use my helmet. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yes. If you, your last question? Hmm. Two last questions. Okay, one, two. <laughs> Hi. Short ones. Thanks, Niels. I uh, enjoyed your presentation. Uh, my name is Neil Morrison, uh, university student, and I was a bit curious about uh, cycling culture. It's been touched on helmets, and with with new uh, new members of the with new Copenhageners learning uh, some something about bicycle safety and so on and so on. I was wondering if um, ma bicycle maintenance was something that's built in to the infrastructure of the city. Uh, repair shops to help support not only cyclists but also a culture of um, that independence and freedom. You, there's a legacy of the original uh, cyclists being hardcore cyclists and I think a lot of the cyclists that continue through the winter here, similar to maybe your 60% are people who are quite uh, intimately tied to their bicycles. Um, I was just wondering, yeah, as far as the culture goes, uh, if bicycle, bicycle repair is something that's built into your, your plan and we have a very large number of bicycle repair shops in Copenhagen. I don't remember the figures, but it's really, on my way from my home uh, to my workplace, it's about eight kilometers, uh, I have at least more than 10 
passing more than 10 uh, bicycle maintenance jobs. So that's a huge number of this. This is also because it's a very easy thing to do if you don't have skills or coming from another country, starting your own uh, career. Uh, a bicycle shop is very easy to do. You don't have to invest very much money. You can't, that's it. So there's a lot of people there trying to build up a, a business on bicycle repair shops, a lot of them. About the biking culture, there is, uh, of course, developing a lot of subcultures into the biking culture of Copenhagen. One is the very, the ones that go like, like Lance Armstrong, I mean, in the morning, go at very high speed and push into anyone else. And there's a lot of subcultures with, with large trolleys having their kids inside this box in front of, the, um, in front of the, the bicycle and things like this. So it's quite interesting to see what develops. And I think we are developing quite a lot of subcultures these years, actually, from you can see from the pictures as well. Last question. Thank you very much for your interesting lecture. Um, you know, you have a lot of experience about setting up uh, cycle transport in the city of Copenhagen and that. And um, my feeling is North American uh, planners do not have the same understanding of cycling and uh, the same experiences. Do you, are there any uh, master's courses or programs in um, Copenhagen that are being offered by your group to Europeans or, and or North Americans? We were actually thinking about that in the office because we have quite a many visitors, uh, also from North American cities, and we take all the visitors and we show them the around and we try to teach them whatever we can about our, the way that we work. But at some time they say, well, too many visitors. Why don't we call upon everybody that's interested in, in bicycle issues and have them come to Copenhagen at one time, making sort of a master class or one big exercise or whatever. And that's what we're actually planning to do now. The 22nd, 22nd of June next year, we will have a large conference in Copenhagen, so I hope to see some of you there. Uh, exactly for this reason, trying to use the situation in Copenhagen as a demonstration tool, trying to build up a bicycle, worldwide bicycle culture, trying to learn from each other, trying to learn, well, how are you doing in North American cities, which have maybe two, three, or four percent of bicycles? What are you doing in, in some of the European cities that are going at 20 or 30 percent? And try to learn from each other on these kind of different starting points and even taking African and Asian citizens as well. So that is actually preparing right now to have this uh, conference in, the, in, in June next year. Oh, world premiere. Pardon? A world premiere. A world premiere. Last thing, I will promise you a surprise. And the surprise is that actually, um, some of you might have seen a cycling video from Copenhagen that was made a few years ago. And uh, it has been very, uh, very widespread all over the world. It's been used for several locations, and it's been used even in cities like Sydney to, to convince the city council about bicycle issues and things like that. We thought in Copenhagen this video was a little bit too old, and we had the old mayor of that as well. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I had other glasses and things like that. Now, so we decided to make a new one, and he asked one of our uh, very good partners to, uh, to make a three-minute uh, video DVD about uh, cycling culture in Copenhagen. And when I left the office, I actually took it from the table of the producer saying, well, I'm gonna use this and go to, to North America. It's not finished yet, and it doesn't have the credits anywhere, and you will be the first one to see it, actually. So, if I can make this work.
for your intentions.